Everyone's like, are they, are they the lovers? No, we're friends. Friends, huh? Oh, we'll see about that. Solar Opposites is a Hulu-exclusive animated adult series that follows a team of aliens with a mission to recreate their homeworld, but are stranded on Earth. When they're not getting into sci-fi adventures, they try being a normal family to better blend in on Earth and for the betterment of each other. At any other time, I'd love to just goobler on about how this show is so great and a refreshing take on the overly saturated adult family sitcom genre, but for now, I seek to answer the question all fans have about this series. Does Terbo is gay? So like that, subscribe, comment your share, and let's get into it. The leader, head scientist, and perpetually having a stick up his mound about keeping his team in order for the mission, Corvo hates the Earth and humans with a passion and just wishes to fix the ship to escape it and or hopes that the pupa terraforms it. You know, whichever happens first. Corvo doesn't do well in social settings. He is usually stressed out and tries way too hard to win the approval and affection of others. In the Quantum Ring, he went as far as becoming a world-famous magician just to stick it to his family, but in actuality, he just wanted them together for a Taco Tuesday ship manual debriefing. Corvo tends to go the extra mile and a half to get his way, feel appreciated, or force his family team to listen to him. He's a complete buzzkill that bosses Terry and the replicants to do their jobs when they're goofing around. On the surface, his team seems incompetent, but in actuality, it's Corvo's mismanagement in leading them is what makes them this way. His his narrow-minded goal of repairing the ship to leave Earth made life for his family complicated, but in their own crazy way, they were fulfilling their mission roles. Yumulak keeps an assortment of weapons that can keep the team safe, Jesse is naturally a good listener to keep record of the mission's progress, and even Terry has gotten a little better at taking care of the pupa. He expects them to screw up so often that he doesn't see the actual work they're putting into the mission. In the sacred non-repeating number, the team finds another Schlorpian group that's been on Earth for over a year too. Unlike Corvo's team, these guys still uphold their Schlorpian customs and traditions, compared to Terry and the replicants' love of human culture and self-indulgence, feeling more appreciated and at home with the London-based Schlorpians, Corvo decides to move in with them. Ayo, hey, foreshadowing? You can take the Schlorpian out of London, but you can't take the London out of Schlorpians. Leaving Terry and Jesse at first pleased to do as they want, but soon are lost without Corvo taking care of everything around the house and the ship. But Corvo's time on Earth has also made him soft, making a complete Terry of himself in front of the other Schlorpian team. Corvo would sooner blast himself with the inside out ray before admitting that he has grown accustomed to Earth and enjoys what little it has to offer. So to prove his Schlorpian worth to them, Corvo offers the pupa to his new team, but Terry and Jesse admit their defeat and begs him to return. Unfortunately, the rich Schlorpians don't take the news all too well and try taking the pupa by force, but thanks to some clever thinking, Corvo was able to save his team. Even with all of their many, 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 many flaws, Corvo's loyalty to his family team runs as deep as his desire to be needed and adored. Though he has a tendency of trying to shape his family into perfection for both the mission and his sake, Corvo learns to accept them as they are, complete weirdos that would be utterly lost without him. As the series progresses and he almost gets turned into goo, Corvo decides to ease off on ship repairs and try to find some joy on Earth as his Schlorpian family has done. He tries getting into different hobbies and eventually he and Terry bond more throughout the later seasons. The easygoing, gullible, kind, dim-witted Terry is the team's pupa expert, she says with heavy quotation marks on expert. Because Terry isn't the sharpest crayon in the icebox, he's a lax slacker by nature, airheaded his way through basic training, and relies heavily on Corvo when it comes to the more hard sci-fi stuff. Unlike Corvo, Terry loves living on Earth. His charisma is infectious and befriends humans easily and has extensive pop cultural knowledge from consuming a lot of television and movies. It takes a lot to get Terry off his lazy mound to do just about anything regarding the mission, but as a last resort, he is capable. In Lava Tech Reactor, Corvo and Terry attend a local college. While Corvo is taking his studies seriously, Terry is living his best main character fantasies. Unfortunately, Terry isn't learning the discipline Corvo had hoped for his character arc. Instead, he's been out partying and doing every classmate he can, but his fun soon comes to an end when finals approach. Corvo threatens to provoke all of Terry's privileges if he fails, so Terry buckles down, studies like he's never studied before, and <laughs> ah, no, 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 I'm just kidding. Uh, Terry blasts Corvo with the dumb ray and throws a wild party instead. But dumb Corvo's drink spills and causes the ship's ice lava core to spread across the entire town, encapsulating anyone who touches it. 
Terry had to take initiative, read a book, and actually comprehend what it was saying to him on how to repair the core and save everyone. Plus, he gets a taste of his own medicine when dealing with himself. Uh, I mean, a dumb Corvo. While Terry can be a lazy sack, when push comes to shove, he can be more capable than given credit, if he puts his mind to it. I believe Terry could be more competent if he applied himself more often, but uh, Schlorp knows he's too lazy for that. And even if he wasn't, in the Lake House device episode, Corvo uses time-traveling letters to change Terry to be more like him, which seems perfect at first, until one too many adjustments turned Terry into a murderous psychopath. It took Corvo getting killed, and Terry living an entire lifetime with his blind wife for him to realize that changing Terry into something he isn't was wrong. Hilarious in hindsight, really. Terry is already enough as he is, and I'm glad Corvo finally sees that now. In Retracer Stepalizer, we learn that Terry had a life mate before Planet Schlorp was obliterated, but they weren't very loyal to Terry anyway, so they're as good as broken up as it seems. Which means Terry could have a new life mate, and you already know where this is going. Terrible is the textbook definition of an odd couple. Mr. Neat, Tidy, Law Abiding, By the Book, Forced to Live Slash Work with Mr. Messy, Slob, Zany, Risk Taker, Plays by His Own Rules. Despite the name, they're usually not a romantic couple, though depends on the show in question. Despite their differences and many arguments throughout the series, Terry and Corvo are a strong, adorable, and hilarious couple. It might not have been clear what their relationship was to one another in season one. No, nope, just nope, two I'm friends holding hands down the street. Everyone's like, are they, are they the lovers? No, we're friends. But season two added some much needed clarity to their relationship. The holiday specials dropped more hints. Season three had them behaving more like a couple. And by season four, there's no denying it. But because Solar Opposites isn't primarily a romance, Terry and Corvo's relationship ship status isn't the central focus of the show. They've been on Earth for a year, which means they have a previously established relationship to one another and treat each other as such. So there's no big confession scene or anything like that because why would an established couple even need that in the first place? Plus the humans assume that they're a couple anyway and they don't deny it. Looking back on the Retrace Your Stepalizer episode, Terry and Corvo travel back in time and we get to see their first impressions of each other. Right off the bat, it was not looking good. Corvo insulting Terry's intelligence to his colleagues, and Terry calling Corvo boring to his previous life mate. Their present day selves didn't like what they had to say about each other and started fighting. The only thing that stopped them from completely separating was seeing their past selves with their replicants. Terry and Corvo realized that at some point they became a real family, not just for the mission, and they don't want to throw it away. Oh my gosh, they're so cute reminiscing on all the good times that they've shared together and the weird family that they've built. <laughs> and working together to beat the living daylights out of Vambo. Ah, I love these aliens, even though that episode kind of ended on not being real, but more like an in-universe what-if story composed from the aliens' holodeck. But who cares, man? It's still canon. And while we're on the topic of the past, it's important to note that in the season four episode, The Ping Pong, we see a flashback of how Jesse and Yumulak, Terry and Corvo's respective replicants, were grown. They were wilting in separate pots, but when placed together, they blossomed faster and stronger than the other replicants that were potted. And again, because I'm never gonna let this go, seeing the replicants while they were in the past was also the reason why they stopped fighting. Through all of their ups and downs, the family they built was always meant to be because their replicants thrived better together as siblings, just as those two idiots thrive better as partners and husbands. That's my headcanon as to why they were assigned to each other anyway. Now you look me in the eye and tell me that Corvo and Terry aren't meant to be life mates, damn it! Oh, I am getting way ahead of myself. Goodness. Anyway. Episode 1 is a great example of these two idiots bonding over a common interest. Fun bucket! While Corvo would rather sulk about being on Earth than let Terry show him the joys of it, they're both watching a show called Fun Bucket, about a mischievous creature that goes on sci-fi adventures and pulls pranks on humans. Now because Terry and Corvo are aliens, they thought Fun Bucket was real, and that they could all hang out, help with the mission and such. But after learning the crushing reality of children's programming, they set out to make their own Fun Bucket. At first it starts out well for all of them, but because Corvo and Terry kept treating Fun Bucket as a dumb TV sidekick, they lose him for some other cool guys. The pair spiral trying to win their friend back and end up creating a knockoff fun bucket instead, which ends up absorbing the first one, turning into a hideous monster, and they sci-fi it up to fix everything, yada yada yada, blah blah blah, not important. But what is important is that Terry and Corvo are capable of sharing similar interests, comfort each other, and work together to fix their problems while they banter. Lots. 
and lots of banter. That's usually how a Terry and Corvo adventure goes anyway. They have a petty argument, have a common goal or desire, work together to achieve it until it blows up in their faces, and learn some sort of lesson about, I don't know, appreciating each other or their own self-worth, something like that. In the booster manifold, after Terry nearly gets Corvo killed, it causes him to Google her more than ever, which is how their species release pent-up stress. Terry was able to calm him down with talk of how much fun they're gonna have once they buy a jet ski later that day, but finding all of Terry's genes in the freezer causes Corvo to get so upset that he coughs up a red goobler. And, uh, what do the red ones do? I don't know. Unlike regular harmless gooblers, a red goobler comes about every 100,000th goobler due to an absurd amount of stress on a scorpion. Why are you always so stressed? Why, why, why? Come on, tell me, man, why? Red gooblers will stop at nothing to kill their host, putting Corvo on full alert when the little red guy eventually comes for him. Ironically, he's producing even more gooblers now from all the stress and nerves, and it's interfering with his and Terry's jet ski plans. So the pair decides to take the fight directly to the red goobler at Corvo's most stressful place, a parody safe Halloween store. You know what? Valid. I hate those little spooky ass stores too. They managed to capture the red goobler and later on help the rebel kids stab some kids. Doesn't matter. Moving on. That next questions you don't want answers to. But it turns out the little guy escaped. Instead of telling Corvo the truth, Terry lied instead to save him from all the stress. But the mere thought of that red little shit still being out there causes Terry to goobler. And it does return, by the way. But Terry had good intentions and did it for Corvo's sake. So that has to count for something. Even though he causes at least half of the Gooblers Corvo makes, Terry does care for his well-being. In Edamami Duffel Bag, Corvo tries finding a hobby that he can call his own, but is irritated when he learns that Terry shares all of them too. Model Trains was his last resort, and Corvo does it up big, impressing all of the fellow model train enthusiasts. But it's short-lived once Terry joins the fun. So Corvo, feeling that the hobby he wanted to define him was taken over by his space husband, builds a ray that turns everything into life-size model train pieces, and then himself into a train. Seems like a perfectly rational response if you ask me. But it looks like Terry only had that many hobbies because he wanted to share them with Corvo. That's why he got into model trains in the first place. Corvo, you aren't what you do. You're who you love. And that's me. Now that that's all cleared up, and once his body reverts back from being a train, Corvo is going to try one of Terry's hobbies next episode and make a real effort into liking it. The Pupa's Big Day is a bottle episode where Corvo joins Terry in his exciting and all-time favorite hobby of standing in a line. It's a very serious, highly intensive hobby, not for the faint of heart. Sadly, Corvo doesn't have what it takes and knew he was a quitter. And just when he was about to leave, in comes Linus, Terry's line husband. And you can just taste Corvo's jealousy as soon as he sees this guy. Yeah, you introduce yourself as Terry's actual husband and partner. Mark that territory, stake your claim, girl. This Linus character is awfully chummy with his Terry and seems to know him better than Corvo does. It's honestly really enduring to watch Corvo get so possessive and compete over Terry when it comes to knowing about his hobby Ah, oh, it's so cute. He truly does care. He truly does like him. To no one's surprise, Linus is a two-faced POS that wants Terry all to himself and makes Corvo look bad in front of him. But Corvo caught that pavement-sucking SOB slipping. He didn't call for a line check when he stepped out of line. So now he lost his place. Boom! If there's one thing Corvo's great at, it's remembering arbitrary rules, baby! Linus shows his true face and starts a new line to spite them. Terry gets upset with Corvo for picking this fight in the first place and turning his beloved hobby into a nightmare, but he's also very proud of Corvo for honoring the rules of the line. And Corvo compliments how great of a line stander Terry is. It gives him the motivation to outline Linus, which works! Because Corvo used sci-fi to turn everyone in Linus's line the opposite way so the store had to pick Terry's line. Though they promised each other not to use any sci-fi or rays while waiting in line to preserve honor, Corvo did it anyway for Terry. Corvo understands that this is a hobby that means so much to him, so he wanted to help him to ensure that victory he so rightfully deserves and to screw over Linus. Ah, yes, they are really goals. Eat shit and die, Linus. I got all the husband I need right here. These two go the extra mile for one another, even behind each other's backs. That's not real love, and I don't know what is. Now, during season four, the Solar Opposites are trying to be a more normal family for the pupa's sake. Corvo and Terry were working a boring job and schemed to get a ping pong table for the office, but their plans went a bit off the rails when they accidentally killed their boss. 
Afterwards, Terry gets promoted to being the top boss to Corval's frustration and tries to usurp him Gerald's game style. But in his own party-driven way, Terry was actually being a good boss for their company, to Corval's surprise and delight. If he had just believed in Terry in the first place, they would have avoided nearly drowning in honey. Corvo and Terry have had such great chemistry this season. The usage of pet names, supporting each other, background adorableness. They still bicker, of course, but peak Terravo was in the episode, the revisibility Boya Base. Oh, oh, I thought Boya Base was the word I was going to be tripping over, but no, it was revisibility. Re re revisib God! Ah! Damn it! While Corvo tries to stop the ship's nearly month-long offline maintenance, Terry accidentally turns them invisible, which also blinds them because, uh... Go ahead, tell him. Tell him the insane reason why we're blind. The roots and schmoots in our eyes are invisible, so the light's passing through them. Yeah, that. They stumble around trying to find the ray, it breaks, and they continue to fight all the way into the kitchen where Terry tries to prepare for his press-making lesson with a famous chef. Corvo and Terry have had a lot of spats throughout the series, that's no lie, but this one hit a nerve with Terry so hard that he wants to move out. But after they calm down and since he can't find the door, Terry explains that he was going to learn to make crust for Corvo as a way to thank him for all of his hard work on the ship and leading the team. Terry also says that the reason why he doesn't help with the ship as much is because he doesn't know math, which Corvo actually likes. It makes him feel needed and a bit of a scientific hunk, Shlorpion, which Terry finds hot. And now I can never look at a rolling pin the same way ever again. But at least the lovebirds made up and became visible again thanks to Nancy Silverton. But ooh, Terry's getting jelly that Nancy and Corby are vibing. So he sends her to ancient Rome, naturally. And the episode ends with Corvo and Terry kneading dough together as a heart-shaped cutout zooms to black. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh, 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 hang on. I gotta cough me up a love googler because oh, this episode was everything I've ever wanted for them. The drama, the emotion, the intimacy, the love. Oh my God, the love. After this, there's no doubt in my mind that Terrible was not only canon, but they're lovable idiots who are fully committed to one another. Even in the finale where the family starts turning human one by one, Terry is still faithful to Crumbo. Who the shit is Crumbo? Corvo. Oh, right, because I love crumbs. Hey, anyone else notice that Terry wore a crumb dumpster shirt last episode? <laughs> it was unclear what Corvo and Terry's relationship was at first. Friends, lovers, brothers. But as the series progressed and they adapted for the mission, Terrible's love became real, and instead of pretending to be a family, he became an actual family. They're, they're in a spy ex family, you guys. Y you know, a spy who needs a wife and a kid to blend in and proceed with his mission, but the wife is secretly an assassin and just so happens to need a husband to cover up her own tracks, and they have a daughter. She, uh, she's, a, she's a psychic, and she knows the truth about both of them, but neither of them know. Oh, oh it's a spy ex. Oh, it's a spy ex family. Oh, can you tell how much I'm just loving the self-referential humor in Solar Opposites as of late? In season one, their commitment was vague, yet they had an open relationship. But as the series went on, Terry and Corville became more committed to each other and the relationship closed off to just them. Though we've seen Terry on numerous occasions in the past sleep with different humans and even bond with a fellow line stander enthusiast, Corville, for the most part, didn't seem to mind. Hell, Terry slept with his college classmates in the same bed he and Corville share. Well, Corville was in it. The K-Dog was not phased at all by Terry's physical intimacy with humans. But when it came to Linus, oh, oh, uh, big time jealous. Because that guy was more emotionally invested in Terry. How I like to interpret the relationship of Tervo is that it was once a consensually open relationship, but Terry and Corvo are ultimately committed to each other, and they later closed it off. Corvo doesn't seem to mind Terry getting his mound off from humans unless the relationship turns emotional. Corvo was even impressed that Terry held down a physical relationship with an award-winning author. But Corvo got wildly jealous of Terry's line husband because of how close those two were. Emotional cheating hurts Corvo more than physical, probably due to his own desire of being needed. Meanwhile, Terry gets upset when Corvo sleeps around without his knowledge or tries to hide it and not discuss it. Like when he did it with his own red goobler. That act severely hurts hurt Terry and while they moved on from it, who knows how much it still hurts him to this day. Terry is a sentimental guy, so it's no wonder he'd feel betrayed that his space husband slept with a piece of himself. Transparency and communication is always key to a long-lasting relationship, even for aliens. 
Season 4, when they buckle down to be more of a normal family, Terry and Corville are fully committed to each other. We get lots more pet names and general intimacy from these two than we've seen all series long. And there's even more to look forward to with their Valentine's Day special that's going to dive deeper into their love! Ooh. I'm so excited! It'll be nice to cover a V-Day special of a couple I'm actually invested in and care so deeply about because the characterization, chemistry, and writing made me care! Yeah, I'm looking at you, Harlevy! Suck it! The only gay plants I'm standing are the Schlorpians now! So in conclusion, does Tervo is gay? I mean, as far as sexless, genderless, mask-presenting he-hems go, I'd say yes. They're in love, Your Honor. And I look forward to seeing more of that love when season five comes around, because spoilers, they're all humans now with human parts. So Terry and Corvo won't be needing that rolling pin anymore. <laughs> like that, subscribe, comment your share. Thank you, everyone. I'm out of here.